the book that we're here together to talk about is a book that I started working toward in 1964. That's 36 years ago. And when I say I started working toward it, I mean that it came to my attention uh, when I was in graduate school that I felt that there were certain really significant connections between Greek and Indian thought, roughly, let's say, the sixth century BC. There are several reasons why ancient Greek and Indian civilizations were closely related. First, both were deeply affected by the Bronze Age civilizations of the ancient Near East, especially Mesopotamia. Second, both were in the Persian Empire and in close touch there. Finally, there was rich trade between them in the Alexandrian and Roman periods. And by the way, the pictures here will illustrate all this in a kind of loose, free associated way. So there was a commingling of ancient cultures, and I felt that these issues had been neglected both by classicists and, when I looked into it, by Indologists. And it took me a while to realize that they had been neglected because there were certain socially uncomfortable obstacles to such subject matter in the colonial and the immediate post-colonial periods. And that above all, there was a need to kind of keep the Greek tradition seeming pure and Western, and as if it had not been significantly influenced by non-Western forms of civilization. And yet, it came increasingly through to me, this temptation to look more and more deeply into that because it seemed that there was something repressed there. Not something which had just happened to be neglected, but something that had been repressed out of an agenda which had to do with colonialism and racism. Over the 30 years of working on this material was two great trends. First of all, there seems unquestionably to have been an integrated effort of thought that went on in the 6th century BC between Greeks and Indians who were interacting in the Persian Empire. Eastern Greece and Northwest India from about 545 to 490 BC were in the same political polity. They were both in the Persian Empire. They had constant contact with one another. And those are the years in which pre-Socratic philosophy occurred. The evidence, which is vast, seems to suggest that pre-Socratic philosophy was essentially deposited by Indian influence through the Persian Empire, and that the great philosophers whom we think of as the origins of our tradition, Pythagoras, Parmenides, Anaximander, and so on, that they had somehow been contacting Indian ideas through Persian texts and through Persian contacts, and that this is what they brought into Greece. One of the channels that created somewhat parallel civilizations in ancient India and ancient Greece was that both of them were heavily influenced by Bronze Age Mesopotamia. In terms of ancient Greek culture, this really is not controversial in the least. I mean, for example, it's pretty commonly acknowledged by scholars that the Greek hero Heracles is derived from certain ancient Mesopotamian models, including the hero Gilgamesh. So that on the Greek side, you don't really need to prove that. That's already been established by a couple of generations of scholars. But on the Indian side, that point is controversial for reasons having to do with nationalism and post-colonialism. If we look at the first pair, we see on the right a Mesopotamian slide of the type of icon called the Dompteur or Gilgamesh. Dompteur, D-O-M-P-T-E-U-R, means dominator or master in French. And Gilgamesh, the hero from whom the Greek Heracles was derived is associated especially with this icon. We see a Mesopotamian example of it on the right. There's a central figure, usually royal, but not necessarily, who is, occupies the central axis and is holding in positions of submission two wild beasts, which usually are lions, but in this case are griffins. See, so if you look on the left side of that pair of slides, you'll see an Indus Valley seal 
from Mohenjo-daro, in what is now Pakistan, from around the middle of the third millennium BC, which shows the same icon. That is to say, there's a male figure occupying the central axis who seems to be holding in submission to lions. Uh, so that in other words, the Gilgamesh archetype, which went out from Mesopotamia into Greece, also seems to have passed out from Mesopotamia into India and at a very early time. Now, if we look at the second, we see on the left an Indus Valley icon of a tree goddess. You see, she's seated in the tree, and this male deity associated with a bull is kneeling down in front of her. And below them, there are seven little sprout-headed figures. And on the right, you see a Mesopotamian cylinder seal impression from around the middle of the third millennium BC. It also seems to show a goddess seated in a tree, though there are various interpretations. There are other examples that are not controversial. And then if we look at the next, here we have a little tree goddess from Mesopotamia. You see she's enthroned in front of the little tree which represents her. And she holds on her lap a little baby that has a sprout head just quite exactly like those little uh, sprout-headed uh, creatures in the Indus Valley seal on the left, if you see what I mean. The two religions seem to have been intermingling greatly at this time. We're looking on the right at the Mesopotamian Joka bull man and at the, on the left at a Indus Valley cylinder seal impression also showing the bull man. You know, these kind of horn-headed male anthropomorphic figures are very common in Greece, you know, like Pan was one, for example, and they came into the Judeo-Christian tradition as the devil, by the way, these nature gods. And if we go to the fifth pair, it's this common Mesopotamian icon on the right of the lion taking down the bull from behind, and the bull is associated with an ear of wheat. There's something is indicated here about the presence of both aggression and fertility in nature and their kind of cyclical balancing of them. And on the left, there's an Indus Valley pot sherd that seems to show a slightly crude rendition of the same icon. You see there's the bull and the little plant right in front of the bull and the lion, which looks like a kitty, the lion is leaping onto the bull from behind. In other words, the presumption is that all of these motifs probably went from Mesopotamia into the Indus Valley. So there were parallel streams of influence going into India and Greece. And if we look now at the sixth pair, this is a really central icon from ancient Mesopotamia, the, uh, from Bronze Age Mesopotamia, the central mountain with the central tree on top of it. And it's heraldically or symmetrically flanked by two goats who have their paws up on the mountain. And then if we look in this Indus Valley seal impression from Mohenjo-daro, in the lower left-hand corner of it, we seem to see a miniaturized version of the same icon, while in front of it, a priestess is performing some kind of ritual, and there's that tree again. Going on to the next pair, we see a Mesopotamian seated deity, and he is associated with this motif of intertwined serpents. You see there, right behind him. The thing that is right behind this enthroned deity shows what it is. And then we see some village lingam stones from India, which show the same motif of these intertwined serpents. You know, we in our tradition came to call this the caduceus, and we know it because it's associated with medicine and healing, and hence with the pharmacological icon. Now, if we get to the second pair of caduceuses, we begin to see the tremendous importance of this, because the first pair showed how the caduceus icon, which seems to have come from Mesopotamia, was integrated into village religious life in India. Basically, it was uh, a fertility icon, which is related to it, its use in healing and so on. But in the second pair of caduceuses, you see the intertwined serpents at the center of the famous Gudea vase on the right, and on the left, a diagram of the occult physiology of Kundalini Yoga, which of course was a system that developed to maturity in India. And he, you see his inner system of these, this central nerve channel with these two side nerve channels that cross and crisscross one another and touch at seven points just like the serpents is a, an icon of what in Kundalini Yoga is called the serpent power. So the 
it, there clearly seems to be a connection. Now my point with those was just to try to establish something that, that we haven't talked about much, and that is the importance of this connection between Bronze Age Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley culture, because that is somewhat controversial. One of the problems that my book can expect to encounter when it enters the world is that I will be perceived properly as having struck at the very roots of the idea of Western civilization, because the pre-Socratics are the very roots of Western civilization. They are the number one top of the hierarchy for the beginning of Western civilization. And what I feel happened was that many, perhaps most, of the great contributions of the pre-Socratics were stimulus diffused from India during the Persian Empire. The second time when this occurred was in the Alexandrian Empire. And at that time, as far as I can tell, it seems that there was a reversal of the direction of influence. That by that time, it seems that the Greeks caught the ball of philosophy from India in the pre-Socratic period. And then a couple hundred years later, they had gone so far with it by themselves that they were ahead of the Indians. And then they passed the ball back to India. In antiquity, Afghanistan was known as Bactria. That was the great the accomplishment of Alexander the Great's famous expedition into Asia when he wanted to revenge the Greeks upon the Persian Empire for their two attacks on Greece 150 or so years earlier. And he, at great pains and with enormous uh, effort and care, managed to conquer and pacify Bactria and our present-day Afghanistan, and it stayed pacified and stabilized, with some few exceptions, for two or three hundred years, really. And what Alexander did was he created this area there where he left a lot of Greek colonies. You know, those enormous armies that were involved in such expeditions in antiquity, they were made up to a large extent of mercenary soldiers, and the the idea was that a mercenary soldier would, at the end of his service, be given an allotment of land in the conquered territory, and then he would marry into the local population and become a part of it. In other words, these were colonies that were meant to last and become a part of the local culture. The Greeks in Afghanistan and northern India tended to become Buddhists because the Buddhist religion didn't uh, acknowledge the caste system, so you were at no disadvantage to be coming into it as, as an outsider. Alexander left something like 40 colonies in Afghanistan and northwest India at the end of his six years or so there, and these colonies, some of them survived for, it seems, as much as three or four hundred years as Indo-Greek or Greco-Indian communities where those two ancient cultures mingled and enriched one another in what seems not to have been an essentially hostile way. But a branch of Greek culture survived and seems to have thrived economically and socially in India for about 500 years. And this was the time when the great interchange between these two civilizations was, was going on. And the, the area in which most of this contact took place is what's known as Gandhara. And there was a type of sculpture which grew up there called the Gandharan sculpture. What we're looking at is two Gandharan sculptures. You see they're from like the late centuries BC probably, or the very first century AD possibly. In other words, this was, this is in the trail of the cultural presence which was left there by Alexander the Great. And these are clearly Greek sculptures which come out of a community that seems still be, to be in contact with Greek tradition in the Mediterranean. And then if we look at the next pair, we see on the right one of these Gandharan sculptures, but it's a sculpture of the Buddha. Now, you know, it's presumed that these Gandharan sculptures were probably made by Greeks, that is, by Greeks resident in India, or what many scholars call Indo-Greeks. And it seems actually that the very first sculptural representations of the figure of the Buddha, for example, were made by Greek sculptors 
in these Gandharan communities, which were the descendants of the colonies left by Alexander the Great. And in the first place, the Gandharan Buddha head there can be recognized as Greek in, in a variety of ways. For example, by the measurement of the head, this is what uh, you would call a measured head, a peculiarly Greek thing where there are special uh, ratios between the height and width of the face and the interocular area and so on. But also by the hairstyle, you see we're on the left there, that's the Apollo Belvedere, a famous uh, Hellenistic sculpture of the Greek god Apollo. And you see he's got this distinctive uh, hair clump gathered up to the top of his head and so does the Gandharan Buddha on the right. In other words, it, that's really not found very often, very much, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a distinctive characteristic. And what it means is that when the Greeks found themselves living in India and began to make portrayals of the Buddha, because you see the Greeks in India entered the Buddhist community, because the Buddhist community didn't observe the caste system, so you could enter into it. And Greeks entering into India assimilated into the Buddhist community and began to make sculptural representations of the Buddha who had not been represented previously and they decided to represent him on the model of Apollo. See, a very reasonable decision. There's no question about the fact that Greeks broke the code of the logic and the dialectic. They are the ones who figured out how you prove something logically. And this had not yet really been demonstrated in India, although Indian philosophers had produced the great fundamental ideas of the Upanishadic and related movements in the early period. Still, they had not cracked the code of thought, how thought actually proves something. And this was the great gift that the Greeks in the third and second centuries and first centuries BC gave back to India through the sea trade and especially in the first two centuries of the, of the Roman Empire. By this point, the presence of Indo-Greek communities in northern India had been a fact for hundreds of years. And by now, the Romans had begun to trade by way of the Red Sea across the Arabian Sea with both the eastern, eastern and western coasts of India. And there were a lot of Roman trading posts also, like Arika Medu or Muziris. You see, Muziris seems actually to have been regarded by the Romans as a part of the Roman Empire. In other words, there was constant communication and there were something like 240 ships a, a year which went back and forth over those routes. The degree of kind of intimate interpenetration of Greek and Indian spirituality, specifically Greek and Buddhist spirituality, which they indicate. See, on the right is a Corinthian column from one of these Indo-Greek uh, centers in Gandhara of Northwest India. The Corinthian column capital is, of course, a completely distinctive Greek cultural object. There's no mistaking its connection. But in the middle of it, you see among the acanthus leaves from which the floral decoration at the top of the column is made, we see a little Buddha seated meditating among the acanthus leaves. And on the left, a group of coins from Indo-Greek communities which show, again, distinctive Greek styles of representation going on in India. And in the lower left, the, it's the second coin in and up. There is a figure of the Buddha, and the name Buddha is spelled out in the Greek alphabet. So that's kind of the visual picture of how these contacts, which are so obscure and yet so important in the history of philosophy, actually happened. Now, if you focus on that idea for a moment, you see it's rather phenomenal because as the English poet Percy Shelley said, we are all Greeks, meaning everybody in the West, meaning that Western civilization really developed out of Greek origins. But what is equally interesting to note is that Asian civilization seems to have been almost equally dependent upon Indian origins. I mean, of course, China had an ancient culture which was great and tremendously important in East Asia. But still, Indian culture was, back to the Indus Valley, was really the earliest civilization in Asia and 
and it's possible to see Western civilization arising out of Greece and Asian civilization arising out of India. And this is the great dichotomy between East and West, the never shall meet and so on. And yet there was that period when they were mutually fertilizing one another and influencing one another and contributing to one another with what seems like a great deal of love and constructive feeling. And the location where this primarily happened for several hundred years in the early Iron Age was what today we call Afghanistan. That sound like thunder that I heard outside this window six weeks ago reminded me once I learned what it had been, once I saw those two gigundous absences in the sky, reminded me of those fallen monumental Buddhas that the Afghan government brought down by bombing in Bamiyam about a year ago. Trade towers and those two rock-cut Buddhas look rather the same if you think about it. And one was an icon of the East and one was an icon of the West. And that was the place where they had entered into a mutually fruitful birth of civilization experience, which has led to the main outlines of civilization, both East and West, and which has been repressed in our awareness by primarily what seem to have been the agendas of colonialism. I mean that when Western colonizing nations began to move into India, the Portuguese and the Dutch, and then of course above all, the English, they had to deal with the moral weight of what they were doing. And basically a moment of, ah, uh, lightning-like realization dawned in 1786 when an Englishman named Sir William Jones gave a talk at the Asiatic Society of Bengal, which he had founded, in which he pointed out that Sanskrit was an Indo-European language. Now, the Indo-European languages are, of course, primarily characteristic of Europe, and Greek and Latin are Indo-European, and all of the major European languages are Indo-European. And the idea that some ancient culture was an Indo-European culture, or an Indo-European language speaking culture, seemed to associate it with the civilization of the West and of the colonizing nations. The fact that Sanskrit was an Indo-European language was something that actually had been realized and had been remarked upon by a handful of writers for several centuries before then. But it was when Sir William Jones made his great presentation in 1786 that it struck like a lightning bolt into the heart of the colonial project in Europe, because the colonial project was based upon the idea that non-Western peoples are essentially non-civilized, that they are kind of childlike in a way, and that they have to be led forward into civilization and into the Hegelian view of historical progress by Western cultures. But if suddenly this great Asian culture, which was being colonized from the West, turned out not only to be based on an Indo-European language itself, but also to have been arguably the oldest of the Indo-European languages which was literarily developed, then this seemed to reverse the values somewhat. British colonizers had to ask themselves, do we have the right? Because when people set out to do great wrongs to their fellow humans, they generally have to convince themselves that it's a great right that they're doing. And the cover story was always very essential to the whole colonial project. And the discovery that classical Indian civilization had been an Indo-European civilization as much as that of Greece or Rome, or France or Germany or England, and that it was even older, but arguably older than them, seemed to suddenly reverse the direction 
in which the value judgments were going. And suddenly there was a certain internal shakenness to the will that the British had developed for their colonizing mission in India. So that the way that this problem was solved for their purposes by British and other colonialists was to say that the Indo-European input into Indian culture had been very early and very small and that it had been what you, you might say browned out or let's say assimilated to this non-white culture and kind of sunken and lost in it so that Western cultures later could say we should go in and re-imprint that imprint of Indo-European civilization on India. We, they've got a good early imprint, but then they kind of lived beyond it and lived their way out of it. And now we've got to go in and re-imprint it. And this was kind of the feeling that I think that the British had about their project in India, that they were taking up a project which had first been broached by the so-called Indo-Aryans with their migration into or invasion into or whatever it was into India in say roughly around 2000 BC and then again had been re-imprinted by the Greek input into India under Alexander the Great and then the Euthydemid monarchs who succeeded him which happened primarily in Afghanistan but also greatly in Northwest India. And then the British felt that they were coming in and giving a third version of this imprint. So that that was kind of the way they justified it to themselves, that these dark-skinned peoples needed another shot, another infusion of white Western culture in order to bring them back to the mark. Even though there had been this ancient contact between Greek and Indian civilizations, Still, there were supposedly incompatible tendencies in these two forms of civilization. India was seen as irrational and mystical, and Greece was seen as rational and positivistic. And what began to come through to me with more and more clarity as I started studying these matters in the late 60s and early 70s, was that in fact there's nothing irrational and mystical in Indian culture which is not also present in Greek culture. And there's nothing really rational and positivistic in Greek culture which is not also clearly articulated in Indian culture. So it seemed that this distinction had possibly been based on a kind of a wishful thinking based on a racist colonial agenda. For example, the fact that first attracted my attention that night in 1964 was that in the 6th century BC, Greek philosophers, along with Indian philosophers, began teaching the theory of or doctrine of reincarnation, and that they had all of the same elements in place, that both of these cultures felt that it was desirable to stop reincarnating and that one could reach a higher state of uh, spiritual reality by escaping from the body, and that the way to do this was through a series of lifetimes in which one would practice austerities. In other words, one had to counteract one's own desires and impulses and to accept and even feature in one's life types of activity that one would think of as actually negative. In other words, through renouncing the pleasure of the body, you can escape from reincarnation and ascend to some higher realm. Now, this is like a, uh, an idea which is absolutely at the foundation of not only of Indian philosophy, but of Greek philosophy also. Pythagoras believed it, Plato believed it, the Stoics believed it, the Neoplatonists believed it. Almost all of the pre-Socratic philosophers whose ideas can be reconstructed with any kind of clarity at all believed this. This was the fundamental belief about the meaning of human life for Greek philosophy in general. And yet, in our way of divvying up the proceeds of history where we 
shuffle out the irrational parts to India and Asia and shuffle out the logical and positivistic parts to Greece and Europe, we have falsified that. And the reason that this has been falsified, I'm sure, is because of the colonial agenda. You have to convince yourself that you are right to go in and do this to those people, otherwise you won't be able to do it with sufficient enthusiasm. You'll lose your confidence. The distinction between Greece and India was the heart of it all, was the heart of the distinction between the East and the West. Now what came through increasingly to me as I went through these early years in the late 60s and early 70s of learning Sanskrit and going through the Sanskrit philosophical corpus, as I had already been through the Greek, was that this was just simply a misrepresentation. Another thing that has to be considered in all of this is the Judeo-Christian factor. And the Judeo-Christian factor really came in later, and it wasn't really involved with the period of the great interaction between Greece and India, which took place between about the sixth century BC and let's say the second century AD, which is a long period of time. I mean, it's like 800 years when those two cultures were fruitfully interacting constantly. You see, the records of caravan and maritime routes are like the philosophical skeleton of history, the trails of oral discourses moving through communities of texts copied from texts. And what they reveal is not a structure of parallel straight lines, one labeled Greece, another Persia, another India, but a tangled web in which an element in one culture often leads to elements in others. For example, the ancient geographer Strabo tells us that there were literally hundreds of ships setting sail from ports in the Red Sea carrying Greco-Roman goods to India every year. I mean, in other words, there were tens of thousands of these voyages in which not only goods but culture was carried back and forth. And yet, in order to cement the colonial agenda in place, this very artificial distinction grew up that was based on, I, I think, on Judeo-Christian prejudices that British and German and other Western scholars had imbibed, where they were able, because the Judeo-Christian tradition is really based on a process of repression, that they were able to go into denial and simply to repress. It would have seemed obvious from the text. So you see, as I continued to work on this, as the 70s passed, it came increasingly to seem to me that I somehow had stumbled upon an enormous cover-up in the history of civilization as it has come down to us. And I worked, as it were, secretly and in private for about 35 years. And now the results of my researches are at last about to come out in this book, which will be called The Shape of Ancient Thought, with the secondary title, Comparative Studies in Greek and Indian Philosophies. And it will be out by Allworth Press in New York, 2002.